very frightening. She put people in their place. I mean, there was a story my father told me once of she used to refer to Stanley Baldwin, the Prime Minister, as that common little man. You know, she was a very fright. She was a woman of her time. Rem I'm not sort of putting her down by saying that. She was a, a someone of her age, but she was a. I mean, now we'd call it snobbery, but it, it wasn't really snobbery. I, I mean, it's not. It, 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 yes, you would call it snobbery, but it, it's very much. She was someone of her time, and she was. She put. She knew how to put people down. Edith and Charles Londonderry had five children, but their acknowledged favourite was Lady Mary, the baby of the family. She had a traditional aristocratic childhood, secluded from the world at Mount Stuart. Nothing was too good for her. She even had her own garden. Oh, well, the garden was designed by my mother in 1921 when I was a baby. And uh, I used to be wheeled here in my pram. And then there was a statue of me that was done by a very good sculptor called Margaret Wrightson. It was called the Mary Garden. But Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? It goes on like that. Uh, those are the silver bells and cockle shells. My governess and I used to spend a, a lot of the summer here. One used to play with all one's animals, all the dogs. And, of course, doing one's lessons. Are you good at lessons? Um, no, I shouldn't think so. Did you think you were living a very different life from most people? No, I don't think so. All one's uh, friends are the same. Lord Londonderry was descended from Lord Castlereagh, the great foreign secretary. He had money and a seat in the House of Lords. But in the 1920s, he was facing a world in which political power was no longer his for the asking. When he and Edith were asked to host annual political receptions for the Tories at their vast house in London, they seized the chance to impress and woo the new people with power. I was 15 or 16 when I was allowed to go. I watched from the top of the stairs all the people arriving at London House, and the smiles used to start halfway up and go into a broad grin when they arrived to shake hands. Among the guests was a young captain in the Irish Guards, John Leslie. In the butler would, would say, uh, your name, please, like that, and I'd say, oh, Mr. John Leslie. Mr. John Leslie, would shout the butler, <laughs> and you'll shake hands, first of all, with Lady Londonry, who would be very nice. I must have been the least important person there, but said, oh, hello, John, uh, as though you were the chief uh, guest, practically. And then you shook hands with Neville Chamberlain, just how do you do? And then Lord Londonry, who would be very nice too, would say, oh, hello, <laughs> there you are among us, sort of thing. Everyone was in uh, the full dress uniform, medals and decorations. Uh, most of the ladies uh, had tiaras. Uh, Lady Londonry especially had a wonderful crown-shaped tiara and a marvellous corsage of diamonds. So she, you've got the impression she was just dressed in diamonds on black, I seem to remember. She looked wonderful. She had this diamond tiara and then she had a wonderful pearl necklace and long earrings and uh, masses of beautiful dresses. There she stood, looking wonderful, in one of the black dresses she usually wore, uh, dripping with these marvellous jewels, with flanked by her husband and the Prime Minister of the day at, uh, in his gallery at the top of this staircase, uh, which all these people, in their best clothes, gleaming with jewels and orders, were marching four abreast. One of her contemporaries said rather unkindly, I think this was Lady Cynthia Asquith, that it was rather like a musical comedy stage, but it was most impressive. Of course, practically everyone was there, everyone meaning the, the society of that time. Um, uh, there would have been admirals, uh, a few generals, uh, and a few uh, ambassadors, not necessarily every ambassador. And then, I remember enormous arum lilies in a, in a great um, pot, about five feet high, which gave out a wonderful scent. And an orchestra played. I seem to remember them playing the London Vier rather frequently. At the 
parties did not immediately pay off. Against advice, Charles accepted a post in the newly formed government of Northern Ireland. His cousin, Winston Churchill, was very annoyed with him because he said he'd spoiled his political career. But my father said, no, my first duty is to Ulster as an Ulsterman, and I naturally must come back to um, Belfast. The Londonderries went to live at Mount Stuart in County Down. Ulster was a political backwater, far removed from real power in Westminster, and all the garden parties that Edith threw could not disguise this. But then Edith struck up an unlikely friendship with the Labour Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald, the illegitimate son of a farm labourer. MacDonald became a frequent guest at Mount Stuart and at Edith and Charles's house in London. He loved being asked to Londonry House. He greatly enjoyed the company, uh, the, the rich, the artists, the painters, the writers, the champagne, the general aura of glamour, sophistication, and absolute fun. Because I remember when he was made um, an elder of Trinity House, he was so pleased with his uniform, he rushed round to Londonry House to show it off to my parents. He loved all that sort of life. He sort of entered it like, um, he loved it all. Many in the Labour Party saw MacDonald's friendship with Edith Londonry as a sellout. But from the Londonry's point of view, it proved useful. When MacDonald was asked to form a coalition government, Edith spent the day with him at Chequers. She returned with a cabinet post for her husband. Charles Londonry was now Minister for Air, at the age of 55, he learned to fly. The air minister lands on the deck of HMS Courageous in his mouth. Charles Londonry proved to be a capable minister. But the continuing appeal of a title, grand houses and a charismatic wife had helped him to political power. And he wasn't the only peer still in government. There were seven other aristocrats in Macdonald's coalition cabinet of 1931. For the daughters of the aristocracy, formal court presentation continued. But by the late 20s, young women were becoming quite blasé about the whole business. You wouldn't meet anyone or get to know anyone or get asked to all dances because of it. But it's just something you did, almost like going to the dentist. Lady Mary Pakenham was the daughter of the Earl and Countess of Longford. After being presented, she was launched into the old ritual of debutante dances. There were about 80 girls, I think, whose mothers my mother knew and had always known and went to all the same sort of dances. And you didn't care who the men were, as long as you had uh, enough and more than enough. And they came on a sort of list, just the mothers passed their lists around. more debutantes than young men, uh, and so uh, they were quite glad to have you, as it were. I remember one night going to two balls, uh, one in after the other, and one night actually going to three, three invitations the same night. You just went from house to house. After the war, there was a shortage of men from good families, and those that were left weren't always the most glamorous. I mean, the men danced frightfully barely, they didn't know any steps, they just pushed around like a wheelbarrow. And I once danced with a gate crash at a fancy dress dance, and he was dressed as a shake. And he danced so wonderfully, he made me feel I danced well. And the next day I was in a dream. I never saw him again. You weren't really supposed to speak to people you weren't introduced to. I saw one poor girl standing there for a long, long time, and nobody paying the slightest attention to her. There'd always be two or three. They were called wallflowers, poor things. I don't know if that expression goes on still. <laughs> and um, so I went up to her and said, would you like to dance? And she said, but I haven't been introduced to you. And so that finished that. I had to say, oh, I'm so sorry. I thought you were Diana Renshaw. Uh, and um, so um, that ended that. 
The dances got longer and longer as the evening went by. You were supposed to, to have found your partner that you wanted most, and about the tenth dance, uh, they'd seem to get longer. The trouble was, quite often, you were with a partner you didn't want to be with <laughs> instead of the one you did, <laughs> and there was no getting out of it. It was a marriage market which no longer functioned efficiently. But those girls who emerged without husbands enjoyed a freedom unheard of before the war. It was certainly a different world because there were a world with no, no parents in it, really. You could have a great fun as a battle girl, which I did. Lady Mary Pakenham was even able to take paid work, writing a shopping column for the Evening Standard. Shopping was money for jam, really. It was very highly paid and no trouble. They just told you four shops that had advertised. And sometimes they told you to ask for somebody to show you something. Sometimes you just snooped around and saw something that took your eye and seemed new and cheap. And it was very easy to write. It was just uh, what you might say to a girlfriend at lunch. I mean, they thought it was marvellous for me to earn so much money. Start has got his flag up. Let's go. With this new freedom, aristocratic women could indulge in the excitements of the modern world. Many girls took to the air. All of Charles Londonry's daughters learnt to fly, including the youthful Lady Mary. <laughs> 